this is m by m, and b is n by n. This matrix over here, the i and the j values, this will be an mn by mn matrix. And we could write something like this. i is equal to j minus 1 multiplied by m plus s. And j is equal to k minus 1 multiplied by m plus t. And you can check that that runs over all possible index values. OK. All I want to show you now is, let's imagine that we have two representations of a group. Representation 1, representation 2. I want to show you that if we take a direct product of those two representations, according to this rule, that what we get is also a representation. And then we'll talk about what it actually means. So let's imagine that we have got um, a representation, gamma p. Um, we've got a representation which I'll label by a q. Then my claim is that this is also a representation. So this is gamma of t. So let's check the multiplication law. That's our usual um, task. <coughs> So we have, um, let's imagine that gamma p of t1, gamma p of t2 is equal to gamma p of t1, t2. That's what we mean by we've got representation p. Let's imagine that gamma q of t1, um, gamma q of t2 is equal to gamma q of t1, t2. Now let's try to verify that gamma itself gives us a representation using only the fact that the p's and the q's form a rep. OK. So now I'm going to start putting in rep uh, indices. So we've got gamma of t1. And let's give this indices js, comma, kt, gamma of t2. We will call this kt, comma, l, u. And let's now write out what this is explicitly. Well, for this one over here, we've got gamma p of t1, jk. We have got gamma q of t1, st. We've got gamma p of t1, kl. Gamma sorry, of T2, gamma Q of T2, TU. Remember, these repeated indices are summed over, so we're actually performing a matrix multiplication. Now, let's take a look. Here is the index K. Here is the index K. So if you think about what we're doing, we're multiplying these two matrices together, and I know how to multiply those two together. I just use this. OK? So here and here, we're doing exactly the same thing. So we expect to get gamma p of t1, t2, j, k, k, l. OK? And here we are in, the, if we take a look here, there is a t, and there is a t. So we are multiplying those two matrices together. And we can again do that now using this. So if I do that multiplication, I get gamma q of t1, t2. What are the indices? It's s, t, t, u, s, u. OK. But what is this? This is gamma of t1, t2, j, s, comma, l, u. J, S, L, U. OK? So the direct product of the matrices also gives us a representation. What I want to know now is, what are the characters of a direct product representation? So let's try to work out what that is. Um, so now I'm going to look at the characters of this representation. Well. To calculate the characters, I need to take a trace. So let's do that. Um, 
So I want to calculate gamma of t, and I want to do this for, let's say, dre s, dre s. Well, if I write down what is this, this is gamma p of t, j, j, gamma q of t, s, s. Again, we are summing over repeated indices. So that tells me that that's what that is. That's the character of my direct product representation is equal to the character of representation P multiplied by the character of representation Q. So the character of a direct product representation is equal to the product of the characters of the two reps that you use to build this direct product representation. Okay, now let's do some quantum mechanics. Um, <coughs> One of the exercises that you guys have probably done in your quantum mechanics courses, you, you maybe started off and you took two electrons and you wanted to couple the two electrons together. And you found out that when you coupled two electrons together, you could get a triplet. This was a state with spin one. And you could get a singlet. This was a state with spin naught. In group theory language, what you are doing, you're taking two spin one half representations, you're taking the direct product, and then you are working out what irreducible representations appear in that direct product. What we are going to do now is, we're going to take one representation with spin j1, we're going to take another representation with spin j2, we're going to take the direct product, and we're going to try to see what irreducible representations appears in that direct product. In that way, we're going through the problem of, of adding two angular momenta. Now, <clears throat> to do that, we need to write down um, one of the group elements, at least, of course, um, of the rotation group. That's what we're talking about when we talk about spin. And the way that we said that we do that is we don't look at group elements anymore. We focus our attention on generators. Okay? So, so let's start off with a group element, which will be a rotation um, in the YZ plane. And we'll extract a generator and proceed from there. So the first rotation I want to look at, R of theta, this looks like there's a 1 naught naught. There's a cos theta. There's a naught. There's a naught. There's a minus sine theta. There's a sine theta, there's a cos theta, and we want to look at this rotation for infinitesimal angle. So we want to put theta equal to epsilon, okay? And you know exactly what to do now. So, so Jim was telling you how you do this. You would Taylor expand these people, okay? If you Taylor expand cos theta, you're going to get a 1 plus order epsilon squared, so we're going to forget about that. So we would get 1, 1, 1 noughts off the diagonal. And we can write the first order term as I epsilon. <coughs> naught, 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 I, naught, minus I, naught. Okay, so let's just check that. This term over here should be giving us a minus epsilon. Well, the I times the I is a minus, so that'll be a minus epsilon. This term over here should give us a plus epsilon, and the i times the minus i is a plus. So yes, that looks fine. Once we've got it in this form, we can read this off as the generator. Now, this is going to be the thing that would generate rotations. So there's x, there's y, there's z. So what is getting mixed up here? y and z are getting mixed up. So we're performing a rotation in the yz plane. But in just in three dimensions, instead of thinking that we're performing a rotation in the plane, we can think that we're performing the rotation about the x-axis. And that's usually the way that we write things in quantum mechanics, even though that's only specific to three dimensions. So what we would usually do is we would usually call Jx this matrix naught, 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 minus i, naught, i, naught. What I could do is I could now perform a rotation about the y-axis or in the x-z plane or about um, the z-axis in the x-y plane. 
and following exactly the same procedure, I could extract another three generators. Okay? Um, so I would extract JY and JZ. Um, I'm, in fact, going to call this J1 instead of Jx, okay? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll write them down. So maybe this is a good exercise for you guys to check that you actually get these answers, okay? Um, uh, that's J2, and J3 would take the form naught <coughs> I minus I naught, 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 naught. And then what you can check is, you can check that these things do close a Lie algebra, just like we argued previously they must for consistency of the group composition law. And the Lie algebra that they close, so all of you know this, is just the Lie algebra of quantum, uh, of angular momentum. So J1, comma J2 is equal to A J, J3, and cyclic permutations. So, well, you know what cyclic permutations means, right? J2, comma J3 is equal to A, I J1, and J3, comma J1 is equal to I J2. And everything's in there because if you commute a generator with itself, you're obviously going to get naught. And if you say to me, you told me what J1, J2 is, not J2, J1, well, that's just differing by a minus sign. Okay, so everything that you need is in there. And I think that now everybody knows, in fact, what to do. What you would do if you were studying this problem in quantum mechanics is you would define some J plus minus operators. And J plus minus would look like J1 plus minus I J2. What, what does J plus minus do to the J3 eigenvalue? Raises and lowers it, right? Does this sound familiar to you guys? It, 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 it should do. Um, so, so I can write down those commutators, but you can check this, J plus minus comma J3. So to get these, this is, of course, not a new piece of information I'm giving you. You just use the top line. Um, this would be equal to plus minus J plus minus. And, and once you've got this, you can check that if you had an eigenket of J3, then if J plus acts on that eigenket, you've still got an eigenket of J3, just that the J3 eigenvalue has been increased by 1. And we've also got J plus J minus commutes to give you 2 J3. Now, I, I want to make one other comment. So we, we're not going to have time to develop um, all of the theory of Lie groups but that's, and, and Lie algebras. But that, that's well developed, very well developed. In fact, we know what Lie algebras they are. This is not arbitrary. Um, there's... Um, three series of these Lie algebras, and so on. But let me tell you what the central idea is. The central idea is that you're always reducing things down to copies of SU2, okay? So, so don't think this is trivial. This is something to understand really well. And when you come to, come to studying Lie algebras in general, this plays a huge role. Next thing, this operator is particularly important. Um, J1 squared plus J2 squared plus J3 squared. This thing commutes with all of our generators. What that means is it will commute with all of our group elements. If something commutes with all of our group elements, what does it mean? It's proportional to the identity, right? And that constant of proportionality we usually use to label the representation. So if you act on, with this operator on the states in a given irreducible representation, you will get back J times j plus 1 times by the identity. And we use this number j to label the representation. Once you have got a given representation, you are not able to simultaneously diagonalize j1, j2, and j3. And the reason for that is those operators don't commute. It's only if they commuted that you could simultaneously diagonalize them. However, what we can do is we can diagonalize j3. Okay, so I'm going to write down the answer that you would get for J3. J3 would look like a diagonal matrix. It would start with eigenvalue minus J, then minus J plus 1, and it would keep going until you get J minus 1, and finally a J. So these matrices are blocks, and the size of the block, they are 2J plus 1 by 2J plus 1 dimensional blocks.
Okay? So, so this should all be familiar from your quantum mechanics.